Hello, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Dante. Hello, Chamare. You're right. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, sir. How are you? Good, good. Thank you. Um, uh, shall we start, sir? Seven no issue. Yeah, seven yeah. o'clock. Yeah, let others join late. Yeah, Chamare, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, very good evening. Uh, I warmly welcome you all to the inaugural webinar organized by the Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine Medical Students Forum. We named this forum Future simply because you medical students are the future of medicine in the country. Art of approaching to a patient's problem is a skill that every medical student must master. The Future, the Medical Students Forum aims to empower the students with essential knowledge and skills in approaching common clinical problems. So with that short note, let me invite Dr. Ganaka Sena Ratna, President Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine to enlighten us on what future is all about. Over to you, Dr. Ganaka. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you, Chamara. Uh, Prof. Tilak Jayalat, uh, the past president of Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine. Uh, Senior Professor uh, Prof. Sam Guratna, the speaker today, council members of the college, and Dr. Chamara and his uh, future team uh, joining from each medical faculty, and uh, my dear students. Uh, Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine is a, a professional organization comprising of uh, specialists in internal medicine. Uh, in other words, the general physicians were attached to Department of Medicines and the hospitals right around the country. So we have been working together this year under a theme of uh, enhancing clinical excellence, capacity building and humane care. Uh, today is a great day for the college as we kickstart this uh, program, the Future SLC Medical Student Forum. Uh, future has been one of our dreams, honestly, from our inception this year, from the beginning. Uh, we've been discussing this in our council meetings, how best to uh, uh, organize a program for our medical students. Um, college believes, as Chamar said, that you are our future and you, 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 you will be the future in medicine in, in the world. So we thought it's, we have a duty today to create a better future for tomorrow. So we, we hope that we will be able to compile this program, Future SLC Medical Student Forum, in order to help you to become a competent, confident, and a compassionate doctor in one day. And in addition to this uh, monthly Zoom-based webinars done by an erudite teacher, we'll be having a quiz program as well at the latter part of the year among the faculties. Um, we believe this will help you to become a good doctor one day. And uh, I must profoundly thank uh, Sam, sir, uh, the senior professor of uh, medicine. That's how we call him as students, uh, for agreeing uh, to be uh, the first speaker in our program. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I mean, it's your very busy schedule uh, coming over here and uh, sharing your wisdom with uh, with the current uh, medical students and i uh, always uh, um, i must thank uh, along with that i must thank chamara dalugama and his team joining from uh, each faculty for their untiring efforts i would like to name them um tushara from jayawardenapura um chamila dalpadad from uh, uh, kalambu medical faculty and Prof. Uh, Chamila Mettananda from Kalaniya, uh, Palanga Singh from uh, Karapitiya, um, uh, Sujanita from Jaffna, and Prasanna from uh, Rajarata, uh, Prof. Uma from uh, Batiklo, and Dr. Bovatta from Vyamba, and Dr. Udyangani from Sabaragama. Thank you very much, future team, for compiling this wonderful program. And uh, Chamar, give me a minute to tell something about a personal note. 
I can still remember, sir, the days of my student days in Peradeniya, where we listened to you uh, on tropical medicine, infections, uh, snake bites, lecture sitting in the East Lecture Theatre. I think you came from uh, Anuradhapura to yes. begin with, to teach us. Right. Yes. Uh, and I can still remember those uh, good old days. Today, after 22 years, I am listening to you again, uh, sitting with the, the entire faculty of medical students in Sri Lanka, uh, listening to uh, you again, I, I feel I'm really fortunate to do that. And uh, so it's very, very heart touching occasion to me as well. And I'm glad that I was able to play a role in making entire medical student fraternity uh, uh, benefited by this, by your wisdom. So we enjoyed 22 years ago. Thank you very much sir, again for jo joining with us. And I hand over to Chamara for the future. For the Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, President sir. And a few housekeeping messages before we start. Uh, please keep your mic muted and camera switched off to avoid any disruption. And at the end, there will be a question and answer session. And you are welcome to ask any questions in the chat box. And importantly, there will be a link in the chat box for a feedback form. And please be kind enough to fill it up before you leave, because it will greatly help us to further improve this activity. And please note that there will be a live broadcast in Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine Facebook page for your friends who could not join the Zoom. So please get them to search Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine in their Facebook and go to FB Live. Well. Uh, the next item is to introduce the speaker of the day. Well, it is my immense pleasure to introduce Senior Professor S.A.M. Kularatna, who we very fondly and wholeheartedly call in as AMSA. I'm sure he's no stranger to this audience. He's the Chair Professor of Medicine in the University of Peradeniya. He's a great clinician with vast experience in all aspects of medicine. And as a student and as his registrar and his senior registrar, and currently as a consultant, current working in the same department, in the same board, there is so much I have learned from you, sir, and still learning from you. His wisdom is vast. He's fond of patiently listening to a lone story of a patient and analyze the story in such a fascinating way that all the medical students, PG trainees would benefit immensely. He's a great teacher. Many, many generations of students, to, uh, medical students are so fortunate to be taught by him and examined by him at the clinical examinations in every faculty of the country. Professor Kulratna is among the top 2% of world-renowned scientists. His research work is mainly on tropical medicine and toxicology. His work is published in many internationally recognized high-impact journals. He has done so many orations based on his work in tropical medicine and toxicology. Above all, Knowing Samsa very well is a great human being. Well, I might take the whole time of this webinar if I am to talk on his academic and research contributions to the country and the world. So without further ado, let me invite Professor Sam Kularatna for the webinar today themed Approaching to a Patient with Fever. Over to you, sir. So good evening, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Chamal Dalugam and uh, Dr. Ganaka Siyamvatna who actually uh, introduced me to the audience and I am overwhelmed by the description uh, the given. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I remember both of you as excellent great students in the faculty, brilliant students in the faculty. So Ganaka Chamra, thank you very much for the invitation. Again, I would like to thank uh, Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine for this uh, invitation. Also Prof. Tilak Jailat, who also actually uh, link uh, with me uh, to do this. I mean, to address students uh, in all the faculties internationally in a webinar is a, uh, a great honor and a privilege uh, I consider uh, with uh, great honor. So to start my topic, let me share the screen first.
Does something happen? Yes. I hope everybody could see the topic, approach to a patient with fever. So I have been actually talking uh, about fever many times. And uh, in this particular lecture, uh, meant for students. So my approach is somewhat different uh, from what I did earlier, that was for postgraduates and even for the, the, the clinical meetings and so on. I know that students like uh, factual knowledge and analysis of patient's history. So in this uh, lecture, I am trying to give medical students factual knowledge as well as that and without involving with the controversies. So when we hope everybody can see the uh, screen, if not, please uh, uh, inform me. Uh, fever is a common symptom. Everybody knows it's a common symptom. Also clinical entity. There are so many conditions, up to 66 fevers are known. Scarlet fever, yellow fever, and so on. Just to say, fever is a common word we hear every day. So in this uh, presentation, I am taking two short case histories to facilitate the discussion. So please read with me this patient's story. A 22-year-old boy presented with fever for three days duration, abrupt in onset, high-grade remittent throughout the day with, a, with chills and rivals. He has associated retrobital pain, severe headache, backache, and loss of appetite for same duration. He did not have cough, sore throat, loose motion, or dysuria. So we'll take the, the key uh, clinical features, clinical information from this scenario. The onset is abrupt, duration is three days. The fever is high grade with chills and rigors. The fever pattern is remittent. The dynal variation is, is continuous with the day. There is associated retrobital pain, headache, backache, and loss of appetite. There are some. Uh, negative symptoms like cough, sore throat, loose motions, and dysuria. We'll take another case scenario for comparison. Please read with me. A 32-year-old male presented with fever for three weeks duration, gradual onset, intermittent, one to two spikes per day with rigors. He developed pain and swelling of small joints of hands for the same duration. He complained of right-sided pleuritic type of chest pain for one week duration. Again, we'll take the key clinical features, onset, gradual, duration, three weeks, grade, intermediate, pattern, intermittent, uh, dynal variation, daily. There are associated other symptoms, pain in small joints, that is three weeks, pleuritic chest pain, one week. Let us compare these two patients. You see a contrast difference. The onset, one pa first patient is abrupt, other one is gradual. Duration, three days, first patient, then the three weeks. Then the grade, high with chills and rigors, here intermediate, not that high. Pattern is remittent, here the pattern is intermittent. Dynal variation is continuous, dynal variation is daily spikes. So there are associated symptoms here. They are more severe, but here the symptoms are not that severe, small joint pains. So this is a comparison of these two patients, one with three days fever, other one with three weeks fever. So based on that, please uh, take a note of the classification of fever duration. We consider acute fever as less than seven days, subacute seven to 14 days, long standing fever more than three weeks. If the long-standing fever is being investigated and there's entity called pyrexia of unknown origin. In the British, it is pyrexia of unknown origin. In American, it is fever of unknown origin. So in this patient, uh, the first patient, what are the differential diagnoses? So for, for that, we need to have some idea about acute fevers in Sri Lanka. 
So dengue, COVID, we are in a still a COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, chikungunya, chikungunya is not that common. It was a past, uh, it was about a decade ago. Decade ago, it was really rampant in Sri Lanka. Then leptospira is a very common infection. It's uh, uh, coming in epidemics. At the same time, there are hunter infections, difficult to differentiate each other. Then there are a lot of viral fevers, influenza, measles, rubella. Then the rickets cell infection. This is throughout the island. And we see in uh, central province, uh, one group called spotted fever. The one is the scrub typhus, They're quite common. Then the typhoid and malaria. Typhoid is still there. Uh, there are sporadic cases. Malaria, of course, imported cases. Then there are so many other uh, causes of fever that is due to bacterial infection in the systems, urine tract infection, gastrointestinal tract, tract uh, infection, chest, so on. The systems are infected. All can produce acute fever. All these fevers come to about 90% and maybe about 10% fevers are due to allergens, drugs, things, insects, things, traumatic causes, then the drug reactions like serotonin syndrome. If you take subacute fevers, the same causes of fever have an atypical pattern where it can go in a longer duration. But certain viruses like HIV, hepatitis A, A to E, Epstein Barr virus, cytomegaly, herpes, they are more this is subacute. Also, the tuberculosis, some parasitic infections, and this autoimmune and rheumatological causes are also produce, producing subacute fevers. Then, come to second patient, we'll take this. P uh, pyrexia of unknown origin definition. In 1961, the first definition came that is still ap applicable for all our developing countries. So in this 1961 definition, uh, the duration of, of fever is three weeks. There should be fever spikes, more than 101 Fahrenheit. Then there should be a, at least one week investigations in the hospital. So need to meet these three criteria. And there's an entity called long fever. Even far back in 1907, there's a long fever that has been published and that has evolved into the, what is called this pyrexia of unknown origin. In the developed country, now this definition has been changed for the application. That was done in 1991. Again, the duration of fever is the same, but the hospital admission is not mandatory. The investigation could be done outpatient, three outpatient days investigations, or three days in the hospital without elucidating the cause. Hospital duration is three days, or one week of intelligent and invasive ambulatory investigation. That is also while patient uh, outside the hospital. So we'll again consider second patient's causes of PU. The infection. Infection comes to, comes to about 40% of cases in PU. Then the neoplasms, I'll come to that in detail. Then the connective tissue, tissue diseases. So these three components are the main causes of PU. There may be various miscellaneous disorders, so undiagnosed conditions coming under PU. So in these two patients, having gone through these causes, what is the diagnostic approach to sort out the cause, uh, uh, possible? Uh, causes or cause. So the most important step in diagnosing is the meticulous detailed history. As uh, Chalmers said, I am very much keen on this history taking because history is the most important component in the clinical medicine. With the history, most of the difficult clinical problems can be solved sometime uh, even a very extensively investigated patients with all kinds of investigations under the sun may not be enough to sort out a problem that medical history taking can solve within a uh, few attempts. So when you actually uh, uh, take in the history, it should be a, a chronological analysis. So if you take the fever, as I said earlier, the fever should be described. What is the onset, duration, grade, what are the circumstances, whether it is a nocturnal fever 
or with the fever, what is happening to the progression of the fever as well as patient's uh, general well-being. All these details should be taken in a, uh, in a chronological order. Then the pattern of fever is also very important. Intermittent fever, remittent fever, hectic fever, sustained fever, relapsing fever, low-grade fever, and all these fever patterns are there. So pattern, fee, pattern of fever can be recognized only by plotting the fever, daily temperature, uh, we say quote hourly temperature, that's every four hourly, uh, four hourly temperature in a temperature chart. So if you look at here, remittent fever is fever always above the baseline. Or normal temperature. Intermittent fever is the fever spikes touches the baseline and again neither spike is coming. So here you see all kinds of fever pattern. Commonly the remittent fever and the intermittent fever. Hectic fever means fever spikes are very high above uh, uh, more than four degree centigrade of the baseline. Then the irregular fever, sometimes falciparum malaria can produce irregular fever. Can sometimes we use the term continuous fever. So what are the causes of uh, uh, intermittent fever and hectic fever? The deep-seated infections like TB, malignancy, drug fever, sepsis, all can produce intermittent fever. If the fever is coming, uh, there's a hectic fever, very high spike coming in a daily occurrence, we call it quotidian fever. I'm using these words because being medical students, you will come across these type of words in your textbooks. So you should know the definition of it because if the hectic fever, that means the spikes are coming daily. So it is called quotidian fever, right? Some malaria, we use that, it, uh, it causes uh, uh, quotidian fever. The remittent fever, the examples are tuberculosis, viral infections, many bacterial infections. So typhoid causes remittent type of fever. That is the, we call it remittent step ladder. So in, in typhoid, you see that the fever is actually daily increasing, spiking above the baseline like a step ladder. So it goes up. When the therapy started, again, it comes down, right? The step ladder the downwards. We call it fever by lysis. Before advent of antibiotics, typhoid had a natural history. It took about three weeks to go through this natural fever pattern and uh, settled by lysis. But uh, you understand uh, when antibiotics were not used in past, about one third of the patient died due to typhoid fever. Then there's a relapsing fever. Relapsing fever. The Borrelia is the well-known cause of relapsing fever. They are the days of fever followed by days of no fever. It's, it is not regular. That means the patient have patient can a patient has number of days of fever, then there's no fever for number of days. So that is called uh, relapsing fever, Borrelia. But this malaria also is intermittent, but still a kind of relapsing fever but it's a regular. So we know that in case of uh, Vivax malaria, or, or, uh, Vivax malaria is a tertian fever every other day. In case of uh, malaria is cotton fever every second day. Pale Epstein fever. Pale Epstein fever. The example is lymphoma. There what is happening is Fever lasts for three to seven days, followed by similar duration of time of free interval. That can go on for months. So that fever pattern of Phillips time suggests lymphoma. Then the undulant fever. If you plot the fever, it is not coming as spikes, but it comes as a wavy form. That is called undulant fever. The best example is the brucellosis. I'll come to that later. So this is a, a, one of my patient's temperature chart. The patient has a fever and this type of macular papular rash, 
and the patient had remittent type of fever, but with appropriate antibiotic doxycycline, it has settled abruptly. Rapid differences. So this, this happens with rickettsial infection. When antibiotic is given, the difference is very fast, rapid. In retrospect, it suggests rickettsial infection, provided that patient is given anti-rickettsial antibiotics. So this temporary chart, this temporary chart helps in diagnosis of typhoid, malaria, tuberculosis, all kinds of viral fevers, influenza, dengue. In dengue, we call it the biphasic fever. Then the rickettsial cell infections, then the lymphoma, endocarditis, SLE, glandular fever. The temperature chart helps in diagnosis, means helping the diagnosis. It won't be the diagnostic, but it's helping the diagnosis. If, any, if anybody has a question, you can actually unmute and uh, talk to me. Any questions so far? Because I have been talking to you about the acute fevers mainly and the importance of the temperature chart. Okay, we'll proceed. So time to time I'll give a, 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 a break for you to raise a question. I know there are some questions appearing in the chat box that we'll take up later. However, fewer, fewer pattern can be altered by antibiotics, steroids, antibiotics. So when you're actually interpreting fever, please consider this interference. So when you take the fever as symptoms, there may be chills and rigors. Chills and rigors means the spikes are very high. The malaria, brucellosis are examples. Even the deep-seated abscess can produce chills and rigors. In malaria, classically, you get a very high spike of fever. Then the fever subsides with drenching sweating. So I have to tell you, nowadays you don't see malaria, uh, except important malaria, very few cases per year. But malaria was rampant in this country in 19... Uh, up to 90s, uh, 1990s. So I have had few attacks of malaria. So I know the experience of malaria, where you get extreme chills and rigors and then settling with, for that day with sweating. Night sweats happen with tuberculosis. We always take, when you're taking the history, we question if the low-grade fever is coming in the night, but it's called nocturnal fever, if it subsides, uh, no, it is, if it's associated to night sweats, it's more in favor of tuber tuberculosis. Now, so that is the, the, the that is the expansion of a, of the fever as a symptom. At the same time, to diagnose, we need to go through the other symptoms of the patient. That is called symptom analysis or systemic inquiry. So, in your history taking you know what is systemic inquiry. You have to go through each and every system and see whether there are some hidden symptoms that are of importance to uh, help in the diagnosis. It is very important to ask about the patient's well-being, feeling ill, reduced oral intake, sleep, less active, lethargy, irritable, dehydration, reduced urination, pain in the body, muscle pain. This, these symptoms are really applicable for children. Then the weight, weight loss, for the long-standing fever, skin rashes, ulcers, local infections, patient will stay. That these rashes could be hidden, right? For example, a skin rickettsial infection. Then the CNS symptoms should be inquired: headache, confusion, delirium, photophobia, convulsions, and seizures. These we call it red flag signs because if there's a delay in treatment, the patient might die. So these red flag signs must be taken into account. You have to look for it could be meningitis, encephalitis, or intracranial abscesses. Then the cardiovascular respiratory symptoms are these, cough, wheeze, sore throat, shortness of breath, nasal discharges, chest pain. So we need to see whether these symptoms, uh, these systems are involved with this febrile illness. Getting to urinary, to need to inquire about the micturition, dysuria, low in pain, hematuria, and so on. 
the infection may be urine tract infection, pelvic infections, or sexually transmitted infection. Coming to abdominal symptoms, diarrhea, with or without blood, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, gastroenteritis, or peritonitis, diverticulitis, inflammatory bowel diseases, malignancy. These symptoms may be sometimes hidden, so you need to inquire about it. Also, the joint symptoms, like now second patient, the patient has joint symptoms. Their distribution, monoarthritis, oligoarthritis, then the appearance. So some infections like bacterial, chikungunya, they can produce arthritis. Collagen vascular is known to cause arthritis. Reactive arthritis, again, secondary to viruses, bacteria, and so on. Then the, the still disease. So joints are involved in these uh, situations. Then there's another entity called drug fever. Very often in clinical practice, this aspect is uh, ignored or forgotten. We need to always think about the drugs, and drugs may be uh, uh, the, the, the certain drugs which are known to cause drug fevers. For example, penicillin, cephalosporins, sulfonamides, antitubicular uh, drugs, anticonvulsants like penitoin, statins. All those can produce drug fevers. I have put these statins here because of one of my personal experience where one young lady who has been having fever for four months and gone uh, all over the, uh, the seeking for healthcare, gone to many uh, hospitals and so on, but the fever was not subsiding. Uh, later I found she has been taking statins. I stopped that, the fever subsided. So, so always think about drug fever. Then the occupational history is also important. The leptospirosis, you know, the contaminated water, for example, paddy farmers. Then the uh, contact with animals or drinking milk in brucellosis. Then, uh, then the contact history of TB and influenza. Geographical area of living, tick bites in case of picket cell infections. So occupational history is important where all the environmental exposures could happen. And another aspect is the travel history. I have a lot of, ex lot of experience uh, or stories of how ignoring travel history has led to difficulties. So it is very important to uncover the travel history in a patient with fever, for in travel as well as local travel. It is very essential to us where have, you, where have you gone? What you have done? How long you have stayed? What food you have taken? Did you have any insect bites, animal contacts? Or did you take prophylaxis against malaria? So detailed travel history is necessary. So travel history is important diagnosing malaria because we have a lot of imported malaria case, not a lot, there are uh, regular uh, imported malaria coming to Sri Lanka, then the typhoid, then the rickettsial cell infections, viral hepatitis, dengue, HIV, all are related to travel history. Then there's another entity called traveler's diarrhea, traveler's diarrhea. So traveler's diarrhea is the entity. In the West, they talk a lot about traveler's diarrhea because uh, the, the, the people in West, the travelers, they come to tropical countries and they spend their time, they enjoy their life, then going back to the, the Western countries and they develop diarrhea. Sometimes this diarrhea is not settling. The, the victims become emaciated and without a diagnosis even. So that entity is called traveler's diarrhea. It was very much uh, discussed in the past when I was a young doctor, but now of course is less like due to improved hygiene and all kinds of care and antibiotics. Then the social history also important. I always stress on social history, whether about the house, pets, that they are food, then the, uh, even the sexual practices, drug abuse, alcohol intake, immunization, drug allergy. It's important to go through these aspects. The analysis of the history is very important. In the surgical and dental procedures, you are aware that traumatic uh, heart disease, 
and the dental procedures lead to infective endocarditis or even the prosthetic uh, material. Maybe the, the uh, prosthesis in a joint that can get in infected. So, so in this part actually went through mainly the history analysis to sort out fever. Now we'll take the examination in our first patient. These are the examination features. Please read with me. On examination, the patient ill looking, dehydrated, flushed skin, including face, lips, earlobes, mobiliform reddish rash in limbs, pallid areas on skin, no conjunctival injections, ictus or pallor, no PTK, muscle tenderness or inflamed joints, or lymphadenopathy, pulse rate, 88 beats per minute, blood pressure 170 by 110 by 70, abdomen soft, no palpable organs, no neck stiffness, is conscious and rational. So there are a lot of positive symptoms as well as negative symptoms. For example, the skin patient has this flush skin. You see the skin is flush and there are some mobiliform rash here you see. And also you see some pallid areas on the skin. So this is the, the rash the patient has. If you look at the patient's face, you see the whole face is flushed, but the eyes are spared and the lips are flushed, even the earlobes are flushed. So that is my index patient. And so when you do the examination of your patient, you need to do the head to toe examination. The skin, flush, throat, pharyngitis, eyes, jaundice, scleritis, conjunctal suffusion, nail beds, splint hemorrhages, clubbing, lymph nodes, then the system examination for lungs, abdomen, and the heart for murmurs, uh, in case of endocarditis. There's a mnemonic about the rashes. I'm sure you'd have heard about it, right? The, the, we see very sick people must take double tablets. Very sick people must take double tablets. That means day of, day one way, uh, uh, the, uh, the day one, Rash, like to be very cellular. Then the day two rash, scarlet fever. Okay. Day three, pox conditions. Day four, measles. Day five, rickett cell infection. The day six, dengue. Day seven, typhoid. Please don't take this as a very accurate list. But there's a, some truth there. In my clinical experience, I know there's a, some truth that the rash appearing on the fever day. This is particularly correct for this cricket seal infection, the typhus, as well as for varicella. The varicella start with the, 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 the blisters first, and then you get the fever later. The, the, the typhoid also correct. There's a transient rash on the abdomen uh, by about seven days, that's also correct. But the dengue, I'm not, uh, it, it, it is not that really accurate, right? Measles also to some extent correct. In the measles, you'd have seen coplic spots, right? Right, these are measles. If you haven't seen, these are measles, right? We seldom you see nowadays. And uh, you see there's some, uh, the skin necrosis. That happened with meningocal septicemia and the spotted fever, this type of, uh, the acute uh, skin rash, uh, like a fern leaf skin uh, necrosis that could happen with spotted fever and the uh, meningocal septicemia, very important to detect. So this is in the rickett seal infection. You see some fern leaf type of skin necrosis, rarely, or commonly what you get is the, uh, the erythematous macular papular rash. This is a chicken box. You have to look very carefully. Some patients come to you with some odd feeling, aches and pains, and you might see one or two blisters of chicken pox here. You have to see it is blisters, then you can straight away say your fever is due to chicken pox. They are spot diagnosis. This is a scar of a rickett seal infection, scrub typhus, like a cigarette butt burnt. So this is again a rickett seal infection. You see macular, papular spots on the skin. Again, rickett seal infection. And then it is very important to look at the oral cavity, the pharynx and so on. 
So don't forget to examine the oral cavity. Then the eyes. Look for the conjunctival injections, conjunctival bleed, as well as icterus in leptospirosis. And so many other infections uh, are involved here. Then the look for lymph nodes. Lymph nodes in the cervical area are due to TB, uh, infection mononucleosis, leukemia, lymphoma, toxoplasma. Then the posterior lymphadenopathy. The lymph nodes in the posterior side is due to rubella, HIV infections. Then some patients have arthritis with fever, like in our patient. But if you take infections of arthritis, spotted fever, chikungunya, miliadosis, TB, SLA. Right? SLA is not an infection, but these are causes of arthritis. So these are patients who are having fever and the ankle swelling. This patient also having vague illness and the ankle swelling. This is due to spotted fever, chronic type of spread fever. Then the CNS uh, examination is important. They look for necrogenic kernic signs. Very important to look at the optic fundi, look for uh, choroid tubercles. These are choroid tubercles. If you find the PUO patients with choroid tubercles, that is, that is tuberculosis, disseminated tuberculosis. But the choroid tubercle, the are uh, less. Uh, I mean, you find only 15% uh, of patients with disseminated tuberculosis. But if it is there, that is diagnostic. Then the rot spots in the front, you might see the rot spots, like uh, uh, the, the pool of uh, blood with the white middle, we call it canopy of board, canopy in board. So these are rot spots, Japanese endocarditis and SLA. So we'll take the first patient again. Fourth day of the Fourth day of these patients, something has happened. Patient developed abdominal pain, vomiting, postural dizziness. Over the next hour, he became drowsy and vomited blood. Peripheries were cold, bluish, pale. Patient has central cyanosis, pulse rate 108, blood pressure 70 by 60, drop with narrow pulse pressure, respiratory rate has gone up. Patient mildly confused, no, no, no neck rigidity. So now that by fourth day of my first patient, there are a lot of things have happened, and I call them red flag signs. Cold peripheries, bluish fail, central cyanosis in the tongue, tachycardia, low blood pressure, narrowed pulse pressure, respiratory rates, gone up, confused. So something acutely happening need immediate intervention. So when you get this, uh, my first kind of patients, we do a lot of investigations, a lot of I mean, the basic investigations, and and sometimes we do not have confirmatory investigations. So the, this is to show you how you interpret white cell count, TC differential count, platelet count, and the liver enzymes rationally to think about the possible cause. If you take dengue and chikungunya, white cell count is low, leukopenia, lymphocytosis, thrombocytopenia, high liver enzymes. In case of Hunta, it is virus, leukopenia, lymphocytosis, thrombocytopenia, high liver enzymes. Leptospirosis, pyrochete, bacterial, uh, leukocytosis, or normal, neutrophilia, not neutropenia, neutrophilia, thrombocytopenia is common, and the liver enzymes are high. In case of typhoid, it's, it's a leukopenia with relative lymphocytosis. Platelet are normal or low. Liver enzymes may be high or normal. In case of rickets cell infection, patient may be having high, normal, or low white cell count. Platelet again low or normal. Liver enzymes also normal or high. Most of the viruses cause leukopenia, lymphocytosis, thrombocytopenia, not uh, uh, as very low as in case of dengue, but the liver enzymes may be normal or high. The bacteria, most of the bacterial infections, the white cell count is high. But in, in sepsis, severe sepsis, initially white cell count drops. That's, that's also you should know. Sometimes in severe sepsis, initial picture is like uh, viral, right? But in day or two, the CRP increases and the count becomes typical bacterial. This is for, you, for your information. I produce this chart to you to understand. So, I have given the investigations of this first patient. Patient has leukopenia, 
thrombocytopenia liver enzymes are high so you should know the diagnosis i have been describing dengue fever dengue hemorrhagic fever because by fourth day patient has gone into critical phase so we'll leave this first case then we'll now consider the second patient so second patients the examination is temperature is there uh, moderately pale without icterus joint examination acute synovitis of small joints of the hands so say digits respiratory rate 20 pulse rate 120 blood pressure 130 by 80 no lymphadenopathy the faint macular rash in the trunk that faded uh, subsequently reduced breath sounds right okay up to this if you have any questions please ask because uh, I have, because of the time constraints, uh, I am doing a bit uh, fast this presentation because I thought that the students needs to know these essential things. So I have given the examination findings of my second patient also. Any questions so far? Okay. So, the key points in the examination, febrile fail, a small joint arthritis, tachypneic, tachycardia, rashes are there. There's a plural left on the right side, hepatosplenomegaly. So the problems, in case of PUO or long standing fever, the diagnosis is not very certain. So we have to identify the problems. It is basically problem-based analysis. So these are the problems in the second patient, long standing continued fever, Symmetrical small joint arthritis, anemia, skin rashes, patient has tachycardia, right side of pleural effusion, hepatosplenomegaly. These are clinical problems the patient has. So, differential diagnosis of this patient could be infections, collagen vascular disease, inflammatory disease, lymphoma, hematological malignancies, or cult malignancies. So, we have to consider all these diagnoses as differential diagnosis in this patient. So when you're investigating a PU or patient, we do basic investigation, whole list of basic investigations are there. Then we can do the specific investigation, blood cultures, blood pictures, antigens, PCI, and so on. Then we do radiological investigations. Finally, bone marrows and the histologies, biopsies. You know, when you're investigating a patient's PU, ultimately, all these kinds of investigations are done. So these are the basic investigations of our patient, the leukocytosis, 80% neutrophils, anemic, platelet count was high, ES was 76. So for your information, when you're interpreting a complete blood count, neutrophilic leukocytosis, as I said, bacterial infections, neutropenia, I said typhoid. Uh, then the viral, uh, neutropenia. Then the lymphocytosis, I said earlier, then the monocytosis can occur with TB, typhoid, brucellosis, lymphoma. Eosinophilia occur with drugs, Hodgkin disease, adrenal insufficiency. So what is the diagnosis of second patient? So uh, when you are evaluating a, a PEO patient, there's the algorithm. I have written algorithm, but this is the evaluation system. First was the clinical evaluation. You have to go through the clinical features and try to evaluate. Then exclude drug fevers. Then consider all the basic to advance investigations. Then finally, biopsy. That is called tissue biopsy. By this level, by fourth level, most of the diagnoses are arrived. But beyond that is extremely difficult. Then they suggest, suggest more advanced like PET CTs or fail in that to go for empirical treatment, NSAIDs, or therapeutic trials like anti-TB trial, or finally, be just watchful for the patient's uh, fever. So I'm not going to go into details if, of these uh, different categories of PUO. So what we are mainly dealing with the classic FUO, PUO, classic means, the standard ones, but the but the pyrexia of unknown origin can occur in the hospital, that's nosocomial, or in the immunodeficient patient, or even a traveler. So these are all kinds of PUO for your information. I mentioned the different causes of PUO. Infectious diseases are the commonest, right? 
that comes to about 40%, but other conditions also should be considered. This for your information, the malaria temperature pattern. And this is a blood, blood film you have to see. So nowadays we use anti-malarial art, artemisinin-based compounds. In malaria, the moist, uncoated tongue, firm spleen. You remember, please. In the malaria, moist, uncoated tongue, firm spleen. In, in case of typhoid, typhoid it is the, uh, it is the, uh, the, the dry-coated tongue. The patient has not the moist, dry-coated tongue, soft spleen, doughy abdomen. Other things you can read about it. This is spotted fever I showed you. This is leptospirosis. Leptospirosis, zoonotic disease, sometimes even can be chronic leptospirosis, but as this is a very acute type of pulmonary leptospirosis and the renal, acute renal failure. Then the don't forget about meliodosis. In PO, now meliodosis is coming up in Sri Lanka and it must be there as a differential diagnosis and it's not uncommon. So in case of PO, tuberculosis is the commonest, endocarditis, salmonella, toxoplasma, people's disease, deep-seated infection, prostatitis, then the virus causes, fungal infections, all should be considered in PU. Then there are those zoonotic and the vector-borne infections. There's a huge list. Please don't uh, ignore these things. These are important. Being a student, you might listen to these things, but when you're practicing, you might come across. Sometimes certain infections we consider as alien to our country. They are in, in other countries, but one fine day they will be endemic or epidemic in our country. That was, that, that was happening in rickettsiosis and dengue. When we were students, we were told they were not existing in Sri Lanka. But later, in my eyes, I saw these patients were coming. Now you know they are here. Rickettsiosis, babesiosis, anaplasmosis, all look very difficult terms. Lyme's disease, ehrlichiosis, bartonellosis, brucellosis, Q fevers, all are zoonotic and vector-borne infections. Then the PU of malignancies are renal cell carcinoma, lymphoma, leukemia, hepatocellular carcinoma, colonic brain tumors, ovarian cancers, atrial maxoma, Castleman disease. So for the students, this list is important, PU and malignancies, renal cell carcinoma, lymphoma, leukemia, Hepatocellular carcinoma, colonic carcinoma, brain tumors, ovarian cancers, atypical, uh, atrial myxema, Castleman's disease. Then the autoimmune condition of PUO, Stills disease, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, polymyositis, giant cell arthritis, polymyalgia rheumatica, tachyasos, inflammatory bowel disease, besets. There's an immune re reconstitution syndrome. In the chronic infections, uh, is there, it gets some kind of immune involvement. So that's called re immune reconstitution syndrome. Kukuchi is not uncommon. Also the Kawasaki have seen 10 or 20 Kikuchi is uh, in peradenia by this time. Then thyroiditis, thyroxiosis, pheochromocytoma, all the autoimmune causes of PU. I'm giving a big list of things. So in my patient, patient has the Increase liver enzymes, chest x ray confirm the pleural effusions, 2D echo, mild pericardial effusion, rheumatoid factor A in the negative, bone marrow, there's no infiltration. So, coming to second patient, these are the basic investigations we did next. Just to say something about the temperature, uh, I'm, I think uh, because of time fact, I am not going to give you more details. What the temperature is due to a uh, hypothalamus act. The hypothalamus act as the body temperature regulator. So hypothalamus is important in the temperature regulation. So set point is 37, right? So this is the cascade how body temperature is rising to cause fever, right? Cause fever. Then there are what is called pyrogens, chirogens. So I'm not going to go into details of this. And, but mind you, the fever is a beneficial thing, right? So, so don't consider fever as a, some uh, uh, enemy, right? Worst enemy for the health. 
but the fever is something beneficial. This is some protective mechanism of body. When the fever is there, it increases the production of T cells, speeds the metabolism of uh, speed the metabolism of tissue repairs, increase the phagocytosis and bacterial effects of neutrophils, increase the antiviral effects of interferons. So fever is beneficial. So if you do not, uh, if you try to control fever with all kinds of things, then the illness get protracted, even maybe fatal. So not to control the fever uh, unnecessarily, but like in children, the high temperature can cause uh, febrile convulsions. In that case, you may have to reduce it. So I'm not going to de to details. So our, uh, our, in, our index patient, uh, we haven't come to a diagnosis set, uh, need further investigations uh, for the diagnosis. Bone marrow so far did not give the diagnosis, need tissue diagnosis. So what is the next tissue we are going to do the biopsy? Should it be the liver? This is just a, uh, the, the kind of a, uh, medical uh, anecdote is a kind of uh, important uh, story. They say in Sutton's law, if you do a liver biopsy in PUO, the diagnosis is there. I used to tell my uh, registrars about this thing because there is, this is not found in books very much. But I was, uh, I learned it from a very senior physician in Colombo in those days, but I thought that was uh, just an anecdotal story. But later on, a uh, professor from England who came to Peradenia, he also mentioned about it. So I knew that this was a, some hidden, some concept in the medical literature, certain slow, where in PUO, if you do the liver biopsy, diagnosis is there. The story says, the law is named after a bank robber Billy Sutton, who reputedly replied to a reporter's inquiry as to why he robbed banks by saying, because that is where money is. But it is not necessary to do liver biopsies always. The tissue diagnosis could be any other, like an arterial biopsy, muscle biopsy, some biopsies might help. Now coming to our, our patient, finally we found his ferritin level very high, 13,000, very high. So the diagnosis was still still disease. So this patient's final diagnosis was still disease. I'm sure, uh, the, I don't know the uh, Chamara was there, Dr. Chamara Dalgum was there during that time when we diagnosed in this patient, was a true uh, case scenario. So this patient was given a special treatment and his fever subsided. And I'm sure the students know the drug we have given to this patient. Any guess? Students, any guess? Can somebody tell me what is the drug which is given for still disease that improves the, uh, that's uh, uh, improves the patient and fever subsides very fast or rapid? That was indomethacine, right? This patient responded to indomethacine. So it was a diagnosis, a stress disease. So I have taken almost uh, one hour in my uh, presentation. I did it, I tried my best to cover most of the aspects. Uh, this lecture, the, any students want this lecture, please, you can go through it. And these are some take home messages about the fever. Fever is a symptom not a diagnosis that you have to remember fever is not a uh, diagnosis, it's a symptom. Fever is a beneficial thing, right? It's a beneficial manifestation in the body, beneficial physiological manifestation in the body to counter infections. Oh, it is a, it is a warning symptom of underlying illness. So fever should not be ignored. So we have to treat the diagnosis, not the fever. So very often, uh, the practitioners use NSAIDs to control the fever. That is wrong. It's definitely harmful. Except, 
autoimmune and inflammatory conditions, NSAIDs are not given for fevers. But to give comfort to the patient, we give antipyretics, paracetamol. But even the paracetamol, you should be with safe doses. I do not give paracetamol more than eight hourly. But some doctors recommend six hourly. But in my practice, I always give maximum uh, eight hourly. In my own case, if I get a febrile illness, if I can tolerate fever, I do not take paracetamol at all. I just leave my body to fight against the uh, virus or viruses. And generally, it settles uh, without much problem. So needs to accept the diagnosis without delay. Any fewer patient, there's underlying diagnosis. We should not delay it because day by day, patient is uh, deteriorating and maybe a lot of complications happening. So fever is a very warning sign for extensive investigation. So temp temperature chart is mandatory. It's always uh, recommend, we should recommend patient to maintain the temperature chart at home if you're managing the patient as outpatient. So thank you very much for everybody who participated once again. Let me thank uh, Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Ganaka Ratna and Dr. Chamar Danugama, who said like Jalat, who gave me invitation. So thank you very much. And uh, I have actually quotes here, the Mahatma Gandhi, saying, live as if you were to die tomorrow, learn as if you were to live forever. So this is a learning curve, learning curve. So thank you very much. Uh, I would like to take any questions, uh, maybe just uh, uh, if time permits, I don't know whether Chamar is that, if uh, whether the, your time permits for the discussion? Uh, yes, of course, sir. I think there are two or three questions being raised from the students as well. So yes. I think uh, they have raised the hand. So I think the floor is open for any questions. Uh, Navanjana Patiran, uh, have you got any question? Yes, um, Kirula, yeah. Do you have any question? Please, please talk. And I, I very much uh, like to answer your questions. You may be having uh, some important questions in your mind. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I have a yes. problem. Uh, can we diagnose meningitis with a, a spinal tap, something like that? I mean the lumbar puncture? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the clinically, we, sus we should suspect meningitis. Clinically, we should suspect meningitis. So if we take a history, sir, uh, yes. one more question. If we take a history, uh, can we ask the patient whether the patient uh, has a pain like in the patient uh, regarding the neck region or somewhere? Mm. Uh, this, this is what, uh, very important. We know in case of meningitis, the symptoms are headache, uh, then the fever, uh, and then patient may be having uh, 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 vomiting, nausea, as well as patient may be having photophobia. So like that, there are so many symptoms due to meningitis. Sometimes these, sometimes the patients with meningitis they do not have fever, but they have only headache and the pain in the neck and so on. But if, uh, these are shared by so many other causes, we are, uh, that is not the, those are not the meningitis. For example, in case of migraine, these typical headache and even the neck pain and all, all kinds of pain, pain may be there. So that is where you have to uh, take the history, carefully examine the patient, elicit the neck, uh, see whether there are neck stiffness, and then you have to carefully take the decision, should you do the lumbar puncture? Because the lumbar puncture is, a, is not a, uh, it's a painful thing. Also, it has risk. That means you, at the lumbar puncture, uh, at, at lumbar puncture, 
the pathogens might be introduced uh, to the brain. So unnecessary lung puncture should be avoided. So that's where you have to take a very uh, careful decision whether to do it or not. Even I find very dif difficult sometimes as a senior clinician to make this decision. Sometimes in the hospital we say, in the slightest uh, doubt, we go for lumbar puncture, but we do it very carefully under, uh, under utmost uh, st sterile condition without risking the patient, then the diagnosis is coming. But but uh, have to be very careful. Sometimes patient may be having just a mere headache, nothing else. Uh, I can remember many occasions, the patients had only headache. And finally, I did lumbar punctures. Many patients had meningitis. So you need not to miss also. So uh, it's, it needs quite a lot of experience, right? You will get that experience and you have to consult the, the, the seniors regarding that. Thank you so much, sir. Any questions? Any more questions? Uh, Chamra, I, I don't know that they have, the students are tired and hungry at this time because uh, past eight o'clock. Mm. Yes, it seems like uh, there's no more questions, sir. Yes. Think, yeah. Chamra, this person called GGGG has raised hand, neither. Um, Yes, uh, but um, yes, don't know who is to oh, unmute, but uh, uh, he's, he's gone, no? he's gone, yes, yeah, yeah. okay, right, right. okay, Um, all right. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that fascinating talk. And I'm sure this is an eye opener for all the medical students. And basically, this is simply what medicine is all about. And I really appreciate uh, spending for your uh, for spending your valuable time and energy on this. And I'm sure you have covered many important concepts of clinical medicine in the minds of the medical students. Thank you, sir. And um, find I would like to thank uh, the president, Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine, Dr. Ganaka Sena Ratna, and the joint secretaries, Dr. Dilusha Lama Batsuri and Dr. Roshan Lianage for all the continuous and unconditional support on this activity. And also, I must mention uh, Professor Lakshaya Lath and Professor Manoji Patitage, which is yet to come uh, for students. To extend my thanks to all deans of faculty in Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine, namely Dr. Chamila Dalpadadu, Dr. Sh uh, Professor Chamila Metananda, Dr. Udayangani, Dr. Priyamali, Dr. Sanjeev Bohat, Professor Umakant, Dr. Prasanna Veeravansa, and Dr. Tushara Mathias, and Dr. Palanga Singh and Sujani, Dr. Sujanita for the permission granted for this activity, as well as for uh, coordinating this event at the faculty level. And also, I think I must thank uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Dishan Fernando and the Jets Pharma team for the technical support in making this event a success. And finally, I would like to thank all the medical students who have joined today. Without you, this wouldn't have been a reality. And one last message that please make sure that you fill the feedback form before you leave out of the session because that will really help us to improve the next ses sessions that we are planning. And uh, the people who have registered using the Google form will receive an e-certificate from the college in the due course. And finally, let's meet again in the month of June, exactly on 24th of June at seven o'clock with another interesting topic in clinical medicine with a great teacher. Have a pleasant evening, thank you. Thank you very much, Chamber. Thank you very much, Thank you so much, sir.